Good evening to everybody out there on the internet. Welcome to our November edition of Boston Talks live uh, from my living room here in uh, Somerville, Massachusetts um, by my uh, virtual fireplace virtually coming on your screen. And we're really thankful to have you with us. Um, as you know, with our Boston Talks, we like to center in on a theme. And uh, today we are talking about Native American culture uh, and we've got a couple of great speakers who I'm really excited to talk to tonight. And um, we're, we're going to be talking with them uh, over the next hour. Um, and I will be asking them plenty of questions, but I also want you to think about what you want to hear from them. One of the great things about our Boston Talks uh, is uh, that it is where we strive for it to be interactive. So I am Edgar B. Herbert III from GBH's Curiosity Desk, and it is time now for us to get started. So our speakers tonight, who I'm very excited to talk with, are Jean-Luc Pierrit and Gachi Joni Fox. And before we get started, I'm gonna introduce my colleague, Liz, who's gonna explain exactly how you can be a part of the evening. Thanks, Edgar, and thanks for joining us, everyone, tonight. Looking forward to chatting with you in the Q&A tab down at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions for our panel, just put in the name of your town and where you're tuning in from and we'll get to you. And don't forget to thumbs up any of the questions that you like tonight. We'd like to hear from you. So thanks so much. Back to you, Edgar. Thank you, Liz. Again, our speakers tonight, we're gonna to be talking with artist, filmmaker and educator, Gottjeet Juni Fox. Uh, and we'll also be talking with Jean-Luc Pierrit, who is the president of the board of directors at the North American Indian Center of Boston. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to get things started with Jean-Luc. So I'm gonna welcome him to my screen and yours. There he is, Mr. Jean-Luc, how are you today? Anyhow to Lati Lapu, as is our um, practice at the North American Indian Center of Boston. I just wanted to first recognize uh, that I am uh, calling from the traditional indigenous territory of the Massachusetts nation who continue to this day in part through their lineal descendants, the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog. My name is Jean-Luc Perit. I'm originally from New Orleans. I'm a member of the Tunica Biloxi tribe of Louisiana, where my family does language and culture preservation work. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me, Edgar. Really excited. Uh, what did you just say right at the outset there? Can you do that again for me? Yes, Lapu. Uh, that's just our way of saying greetings, everyone, uh, um, you know, uh, it's the tunica, um, so Heni uh, Hotu, uh, greetings all, Lati Lapu, uh, good, good evening, Lawa Lapu, good evening. Um, and um, I also uh, gave a, a quick uh, land acknowledgement as we do uh, whenever, we, uh, whenever we introduce ourselves uh, for North American Indian Center of Boston, we find that it's most appropriate before uh, we uh, introduce ourselves that we recognize the traditional indigenous territory of the Massachusetts nation. So we're doing a land acknowledgement, but we also, uh, in part, we do that because we are making agreements uh, with our host tribe. Uh, you know, a lot of us as urban uh, American Indians here in the great Boston area, we come from uh, all over the United States. And as a matter of fact, we call it the North American Indian Center of Boston because we are, uh, provide services not only for American Indians, but also First Nations um, and Alaska Natives and, and uh, Native Hawaiians. And we do try to do as much outreach as possible to all indigenous peoples, especially those uh, immigrant communities from Central and South America. Um, but if we are not um, indigenous to this uh, territory, then we are uh, at guests, even as uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, and so it is right for us to position ourselves as guests and make agreements with our hosts, um, such as uh, supporting every effort uh, by the tribe, by the original peoples to rematriate all land and natural resources back to them. Mm. I am speaking with Jean-Luc Pierrit. Uh, just a reminder, if you have questions for Jean-Luc, you can pop them into the Q&A. Uh, I'll be keeping an eye on that, and uh, I'm going to try to get to as many of your questions for him as I possibly can. Um, so you 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 say you are from uh, the New Orleans area, but here you are. Um, you live, I think, currently in Jamaica Plain. How mm -hmm. how did that? Wh what was that journey? How did that happen? Yeah. Um, so 15 uh, 15 years ago, uh, this year uh, was 
this is the anniversary, well, this year was the 15th anniversary of uh, Hurricane Katrina, in which uh, my family and many of our community members back home in, Louise, uh, in New Orleans and, and Southeast Louisiana and along the Gulf Coast as well, uh, lost our homes. Um, and so my family had uh, relocated to our tribal land, which is around central Louisiana. And um, I had just uh, finished a, a degree in video game design at that time. So I decided to kind of bounce around the country uh, looking, for, looking for work, uh, doing some co uh, coding and stuff like that. And uh, eventually I landed uh, here in Massachusetts in 2011. Okay. Okay, so uh, so you are the, the president of the board of directors for the North American Indian Center of Boston. What is that organization and what is it generally speaking that you do? Yeah, so uh, this past October 20th, we just, uh, we just recognized our 50th anniversary of service to the New England Native American community. Uh, NACOP first started off in uh, 1969 through a series of meetings and then on October, October 20th, 1970, it was incorporated as Boston Indian Council. Uh, in 1991, we uh, reorganized as North American Indian Center of Boston. And uh, we do, uh, primarily we have a uh, federal, uh, federally funded program through the Department of Labor in which we do everything we can uh, to find uh, our community members full-time employment, whether that's uh, assistance with interviews, assistance with uh, clothes, just, just finding jobs. Uh, but we do so much more than that. Um, our staff goes above and beyond, especially uh, in this year during, uh, during COVID. Uh, we've, uh, we've taken on, um, you know, the situation from the grassroots. Unfortunately, here in Massachusetts, the Department of Public Health does not uh, disaggregate data for American Indians and Alaska Natives. And so we've uh, taken on a grassroots campaign in which we've uh, distributed uh, upwards of a, of a thousand uh, sets of PPE to uh, to American Indian families and um, Indigenous immigrant uh, immigrant communities, uh, so that we can get the data from uh, from the grassroots. We've also served on health ad advisory equity uh, committees, um, and we also do uh, some legislative advocacy through the Massachusetts Indigenous Legislative Agenda. Um, so even though we uh, have most of our operations uh, remotely right now, we are uh, busier than ever, uh, I would say. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to turn over to the Q&A. We've got some questions popping in from some of our listeners. So uh, Jean-Luc Beth, who lives in Melrose, says you just use the word rematriate. Um, she says that's, a, that's a, a term she recently learned. Can you talk a little bit about tribal land and rematriation, what that means? Yes, uh, so it's a it's a, a bit of a it's a bit of a turn uh, from uh, repatriation, uh, which I mean that, that it's still it's still in a way it's um, it's a um, kind of it's it's a way to navigate because uh, as as indigenous peoples we are not necessarily um, heteropatriarchal. Um, our our traditional um, forms of governance are are largely matriarchal. Um, and so we have our own ways of, of talking about uh, what does it mean uh, to not just reacquire land and, and put it into the, the indigenous nations holdings, but what does that mean to actually be a, a steward of the land um, and the natural resources? So yeah, really good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's uh, really interesting stuff. You know, you, you talked to, you sort of mentioned the, the, the Massachusetts legislative agenda I see a question um, that we have here in the Q&A from uh, Nikki or Nietzsche Meadow. I'm not sure how to pronounce the name, sorry about that. But they're asking, what are best practices to convince schools to stop using Native American mascots such as tomahawks, uh, et cetera? Uh, I know that that's something that there's been legislation sort of proposed yeah. uh, around here in Massachusetts, but it's, it's just one thing. So yeah. maybe address that and also talk more broadly about here in Massachusetts, kind of what's going on at the state house and other places in terms of like trying to advance what's going on in the native American communities. Yeah. So, uh, for, for starters, uh, you know, there is uh, native solidarity with black lives matter. We're definitely, uh, feeling the, the boost, 
uh, and the re-energizing in terms of uh, addressing racial equity for indigenous peoples here in Massachusetts uh, through, uh, through that movement. Um, and one of the most compelling things um, that I have found when it comes to public testimony on native mascots is actually hearing from the students themselves. Uh, when you're talking about uh, war chants or tomahawks or even just the cartoon figures that we have on the sides of school buildings. Uh, as a matter of fact, just recently I heard that Saugus uh, has a whole, whole new school building with a large um, Indian head on the side of the building. Um, you know, a lot of that just doesn't make sense uh, to the students that are that are going to the schools, so the cheerleaders, the, the athletes, uh, mo most especially the uh, the youth that are that are of color. Uh, they do not. Um, they are not. Uh, it doesn't resonate with them. They don't understand like where all of the, these stereotypes come from. Uh, thankfully, you know, at the beginning of this year, we had about 40 public schools uh, with native mascots. Um, and throughout the year, I'm actually, I've actually lost count, but a number of them, um, and, and most notably, uh, North Quincy High School actually redesigned uh, their, uh, their Yaku mascot. Um, so, you know, there's definitely, a, there's definitely like a, a town by town, school by school push, um, but there is still the state legislation um, because we do, you know, our community does feel that this is a civil rights issue. Uh, when you go, you know, and talk about the indigenous agenda broadly, we're talking about uh, native mascots in public schools. We're talking about the seal and motto being on display in courthouses, council chambers, the state house. Uh, we're talking about uh, you know, the, the, the protection of Native American heritage, uh, making sure that our sacred objects uh, don't get uh, sent to auction houses when uh, public entities move to deacquisition them. And so when we look at it systemically, we are uh, talking about a, a, you know, a body of legislation that can really uh, help to improve the confidence between indigenous peoples and the Commonwealth when it goes to you know, our youth in schools, when it goes to uh, you know, when we leave school and we become uh, civically engaged young adults, um, and then even beyond, um, beyond the grave, you know, we have to com combat this issue of, of theft from indigenous peoples. Uh, so it, they, this, the, while the uh, bills themselves have their own histories separately, uh, they do function as a system. Yeah. Uh, keeping at the Q and A, a lot of questions rolling in. Um, we have Ken, uh, who appears to be from Brighton. He says, "Hi, Jean Luc. Thank you." Uh, and he's asking about what tribes originally inhabited Boston, particularly the Brighton area, and when. Um, maybe you could sort of just address broadly uh, that that question in terms of you know this general area i know i know it's yeah. it's, it's a it's, it's obviously a big question but yeah yeah it, it's it, it's a very big question because uh, you know uh, this year we were uh, coming into this year we were going to observe the 400th anniversary of the landing of the mayflower uh for indigenous peoples a more uh a more apropos uh, anniversary would be coming in next year uh april uh, 1621 was when the treaty with Massasoit was signed between uh, Massasoit representing his Confederacy and, um, and the Pilgrims. And so that begins the government to government relationships that indigenous peoples have with what would eventually become the United States. And when we look at uh, that Confederacy, we're looking at a whole uh, universe of, of tribes that have ancestral and cultural ties uh, to this land, uh, of course, Right now we have the, the Massachusetts, we have the Nipmuc, we have the Wampanoag within the state, outside of the state uh, in Maine because uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, took up part of what we now know as Maine. So we're talking about the Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, uh, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, um, but then also there are tribes, uh, you know, like the Abenaki in Quebec or uh, the Delaware Nation in Anadarko, Oklahoma, uh, uh, tribes that were uh, pushed out through uh, epidemics and, and, and wars, uh, but still do continue to this day and, and still have, uh, still maintain ties uh, to the area. Yeah. Uh, keeping with the Q&A here, you know, I think for, you know, I, I think for a lot of, uh, you know, sort of non-Indigenous people, 
you know, obviously, you know, we get to November, Thanksgiving, this is kind of like the time of year when, you know, if we're, you know, like, you know, the, the Native American sort of part of the American mythology becomes front and center. And there, I, I find that, you know, there's a tendency where it's sort of such an old story that it, it, it sort of freezes a moment in time. And Kathy's asking a question, which, which I find really interesting. She's asking, what's important for us to know about indigenous people living here in Massachusetts today, like in 2020, not thinking about 1620 at all, but 2020. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the, the main thing, the main thing that I, you know, I'll, I'll go back to, you know, the fact that Department of Public Health does not report uh, COVID-19 cases when it comes to American Indians and Alaska Natives. Uh, our population uh, within the state is upwards of, of 50,000 people. Uh, we have serious issues with with data equity. So when it comes to you know people asking us what exactly is is going on with the community, of course we know anecdotally from the grassroots, um, you know what are the what are the impacts. Um, but you know there is there is a need uh, for our non-indigenous allies to call the state. Uh, and ask them, you know, why isn't data being reported on the indigenous communities here uh, within Massachusetts? Uh, earlier this year, uh, you know, one of our uh, federally recognized tribes, the Mashpee Wampanoag, uh, navigated uh, almost having their, um, their reservation being disestablished. Um, and so there was, a, there was a really big push uh, to stand with Mashpee. At a time when you know all of our all of our indigenous nations are are, are disproportionately impacted by COVID nineteen, you know even though we don't have those numbers within the state, we can look at Navajo Nation, we can look at uh, the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians, who are uh, who were faced with infection rates higher than that of New York City. So of course, of course, our uh, our peoples are are disproportionately impacted by by the uh, by the pandemic. But I would also say that you know. We are disproportionately impacted by uh, police violence, and uh, you know some of our communities are on the front lines of climate change. Back home in Louisiana, um, in southeast Louisiana, there's the Ile de Jean Charles Band of Biloxi Chittimacha Choctaw, a state-recognized tribe uh, that is the world's first climate change refugee community, uh, having lost 95% of their land since 1955. Um, so, you know, we are absolutely dealing with climate change. We're absolutely dealing with the pandemic. We're absolutely dealing with uh, police violence. Uh, so these are some of the, these are the frontline issues that we're, that we're dealing with today. Mm. Uh, question from Emily, uh, who, uh, you know, is asking a, a language question. You know, you said earlier, you, your family, you know, back in Louisiana, language is sort of uh, part of the family business, it sounds like. Yeah. Um, and so um, she asks, uh, what are some examples of how the indig indigenous language or languages that you speak shape your worldview? Oh, absolutely, it's a great question. Um, you know, when going back to the, going back to the point about climate change, uh, one of the things that, you know, in my own personal work uh, that I try to push forward is the preservation and uh, development of traditional ecological knowledge. Um, and that is something that is encoded uh, in the ways that we communicate. So the ways that we navigate the world, uh, all of the ways that we work with the plants, uh, the, the relationships that we have with animals, that is within our language. And so when we actually do the language revitalization work, we're bringing back the ways in which we steward uh, the lands uh, that are our traditional homes. Mm. Uh, Olivia, question from Olivia here. Um, and, and I'm just trying to broaden it out, which is to say like, we know you, you address COVID a little bit and disproportionately affecting native communities, but also, you know, affecting businesses, et cetera. Uh, Olivia's asking how uh, the lack of hosting powwows this spring affected, uh, you know, different communities in this area, if at all. Um, yes. And is there a way that like folks, are there websites, places people can go that maybe financially benefit tribes or give support, uh, purchase products, whatever, you know, due to a, a lack of being able to gather or businesses or whatever it is? Yeah, and I, and I really want to uh, send out my, my gratitude uh, to the team behind uh, the Facebook group, uh, Social Distance Powwow. I believe it's uh, Dan Simmons from uh, the, the Mashantucka Pequot um, and, and his team. 
that have uh, taken uh, the powwow um, the powwow road and 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 ported it online digitally. So, you know, earlier this year we had uh, many people you know dancing in regalia from home um, and kind of you know sharing uh, their culture. But I mean, it is it is highly um, it, it's critical for us to have that. It, it's not just a, a cultural uh, demonstration. It is ways in which we. Uh, bond with each other spiritually, um, and it is in a way the way in which we keep ourselves uh, well. Um, you know, it, it, especially in this in this pandemic. You know, going back to the the issues of of, of language. Um, you know, the 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 disconnect that we have with our elders because they are a vulnerable population that disrupts. Uh, language revitalization efforts that disrupts um, contact with uh, elders that grew up uh, speaking the language or uh, can, uh, you know, uh, mentor the next generation. Um, but, you know, we have, you know, tried our best uh, to port a lot of this, uh, a lot of these efforts, uh, whether they're powwows, whether they are uh, language revitalization efforts, doing as much as we can to port them online. Um, but you know, there, there, it's to 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 mix results. I mean, you know, I can talk about uh, the digital divide within our communities. Um, but yeah, it's uh, very, you know, it's it's felt. It it has a deep impact to not have powwows. Yeah, you know, these language revital revitalization efforts. Can you talk a little bit more about what they are, how they work, and why they're important? Yeah, so um, you know, for for instance, like uh, back in my back in my home tribe, we have the um, the Tunica uh, language uh, language and culture uh, revitalization project, which is a collaboration between my own tribe, the Tunica Bluxy tribe, and uh, Tulane University in New Orleans. Um, you, before that, I would say that, uh, and then that that actually got formalized in 2011. Before that. Uh, it was a it was an effort that my immediate family had taken on um, for for you know as long as I had been alive. Uh, and a lot of it um, boils down to um, you know ga gathering a lot of the uh, language documentation that that survives in archives, um, listening uh, listening to elders, uh, collecting as much as we can of our story and song tradition, um, and and just maintaining that. Uh, you know, until until the time when we actually um, were able to like formalize the program uh, through that collaboration with uh, with Tulane University, the the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, and, and we'll actually uh, by extension uh, the, the bands of Wampanoag uh, that are here in Massachusetts um, benefit from the Wampanoag uh, language uh, reclamation project, uh, which uh, which is in part um, started uh, through through. Uh, MIT Jesse Little Doe Baird, vice uh, vice chairwoman uh, Baird, uh, heads the program, and um, yeah, I mean it. We have gone through um, centuries, decades, you know, where our languages have been disrupted, and you know, with that disruption, again, we're talking about the disruption of traditional ecological knowledge. So language loss contributes to climate change. Climate change uh, contributes to language loss. It's a vicious cycle. Uh, and we have to do whatever we can uh, to bring, back, bring forward our knowledge into this time. Mm. A number of questions here are asking about um, you know, terminology. We're speaking about language, Native American, American Indian, Indian, indigenous. Um, is, there a, is there a right, is there a wrong? in terms of terminology, how should folks think about that? Yeah, so, I mean, you think about, think about indigenous, you're, you're thinking about indigenous peoples versus, versus nation states. Where, so we're having like that international type of language, which is not just, not just uh, Native Americans here in uh, the United States, but we're talking about the Maori in New Zealand. We're talking about the Sami uh, in Europe. Uh, so, you know, for North American Indian Center of Boston, we call ourselves the North American Indian Center of Boston because we uh, provide services for American Indians, uh, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians uh, here in the United States. But then also we have 
uh, First Nations peoples that come to the Boston area uh, using uh, Jay's Treaty, you know, using their, their, their tribal IDs to uh, cross the Canadian border and to come here for work. And so we absolutely uh, use or, you know, we try to be inclusive as possible within our, within our languages. But of course, like when we were speaking about our own communities, our own families, uh, we definitely use, I, I use Tunica Biloxi. Mm. Uh, final question for you, Jean-Luc, I gotta let you go, sadly, but <laughs> Olivia asks, uh, how can I, as just one person, help advocate for American Indians? What, what, what can general person do to learn, to advocate, etc.? Yeah, I mean, uh, you can go to uh, nacop.org, uane.org. Uh, we have uh, we have donation uh, links uh, behind me. My my uh, background is actually the National Day of Mourning, which is now in its fifty uh, first first year of, of of observance. Of course, we're going to uh, modify the program in response to the uh, the pandemic, but that's something that's coming up uh, next week. But I urge everybody to go to maindigenousagenda.org. Uh, to learn about the bills that are currently in the, uh, the Massachusetts legislature, of course, we're very uh, we're very happy that the Senate has voted unanimously unanimously to pass the seal and motto bill, uh, and we're very hopeful for the mascots and for Native heritage. But we need uh, more people to contact their legislators uh, here within the Commonwealth. So please uh, do all you can, uh, and yeah, looking forward to to building with everybody that's here on the uh, on the. Uh, on the show. <laughs> <laughs> the show, the chat, the computer, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever you want to call it, hey, whatever. <laughs> I uh, know. Jean-Luc, Pierre, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with uh, me and all of us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was Jean-Luc. We've still got Gachi Juni uh, to speak with and uh, a little bit of trivia, which is a little bit of a tradition that we have here at Boston Talks. But before we do any of that, I'm going to kick things over to my colleague, Sarah, who has some very important messages for you there at home. Thanks, Edgar. And thanks everyone for spending some time with us this evening while Boston talks about Native American language and culture. Viewers and listeners turn to GBH for many reasons, whether it's to learn something new about indigenous culture or to simply be entertained for a while. If you feel GBH is worth listening to, worth watching and worth supporting, then please make a donation. Today, when you show your support by making a one-time donation of $60 or by giving $5 each month as a sustaining member, we'll say thanks by sending you this midnight blue GBH covered Tumblr. You can visit wgbh.org slash support events and make a donation in any amount. Every dollar our donors give enables GBH to continue producing great virtual events like this one year round. You can simply click on the link that just popped up in the chat wherever it is on your screen and you can contribute what you can. Thanks for joining us. And now back to Edgar. Thank you, Sarah. Make that donation. Keep us alive. Uh, so thanks for being with us. Uh, as I said, we've got uh, another speaker, a uh, filmmaker, educator, artist, Gajit Juni Fox. Uh, but before we do that, we have a little bit of a tradition of uh, having a little bit of trivia here at Boston Talks. So uh, we're going to do that this way with the poll function. So basically, we're going to throw up a couple of uh, questions for you. They're going to be multiple choice, and you all have an opportunity to weigh in, and we'll see collectively how we do at answering a few trivia questions. So let's maybe bring that first question up on the screen and see if it works. There we go. You refer, well, we got a couple questions. Let's stick with one. If you can, stick with the first question up there on the screen, folks. Uh, the question is, what does GBH stand for? God bless Harvard, good broadcasting habits, or Great Blue Hill? So weigh in if you can, uh, and maybe if you have to weigh in on both for it to work and submit, or all of them and submit, maybe do that, and then we'll go through them. I don't know. A little, uh, little bit of mystery going on with how the poll has uh, popped up here today. So... Why don't we go ahead and if it looks like you have to weigh in on every question in order to submit, go ahead and do that. And then we'll go through the answers one at a time. So read off those questions, have a look. Question number two, often referred to today as the three sisters. These crops have been a staple in many native cultures throughout the Americas for centuries. Our third question, November, the month that we are in, it comes from a Latin word, which means what? 
See our fourth question uh, about the incoming Congress, which will see a record number of Native Americans in the House of Representatives, six candidates winning their election this cycle. Uh, question related, what is the highest office held by a Native American in US history? And our final question, what are the three fall signs of the Zodiac? So weigh in with your answers. And I think probably what we're gonna do, we're live. We're live from my living room. It's crazy. We don't know what's going to happen. I think once everybody's kind of weighed in, we're going to bring the answers up. <clears throat> Maybe we can try and do that now ish. Maybe it's working. Maybe it's not. A little unclear what's happening. All right. So we're going to give you a little bit of time. Yep. Looks like they all happened at once. And. Drum roll, see if we can get the answers to pop up. All right, let's see how we did, folks. Uh, all right, so GBH, what does it stand for? Most of you got there with Great Blue Hill. Of course, you heard Jean-Luc talking about uh, the Massachusetts tribe. We are in a state which we call Massachusetts. Um, the Great Blue Hill uh, and the Blue Hills in general uh, is uh, referenced in that term, in that name, Massachusetts that is uh, referring to the Blue Hills. Uh, and Great Blue Hill is where our uh, transmitter is, which is why GBH is called Great Blue Hill. Uh, so 81% of you got that right. Question number two, uh, often referred to as the three sisters. Uh, we got 93% of you correct with squash, corn, and beans. Uh, number three, the name November comes from a Latin word meaning, yes, of course, the answer there is nine. Uh, the uh, Romulus uh, Roman calendar originally was 10 months uh, and November was the ninth month, uh, hence November being the 11th month now because they popped January and February on top of that. Uh, question number four, incoming Congress will see a record number of Native Americans in the House, six candidates winning elections, highest office ever held by a Native American in the US. We have 41% of you with the president pro tempore of the US Senate, 29% say Speaker of the House and 29% say Vice President. And the answer actually is Vice President, Charles Curtis, who was the Vice President under Hubert, uh, Herbert Hoover. This was in the late 20s, early 1930s. Uh, he had a white father and his mother was uh, a member of the Kaw Nation. Uh, he himself uh, spent much of his childhood with his maternal grandparents on the Kaw Reservation in Kansas. He spoke Kansa, which was, is a Native American language. And uh, he was a member of the Kaw Nation, uh, Vice President of the United States. Uh, final question, <clears throat> three signs of the Zodiac that fall in fall, Libra, Scorpio, and Sagittarius. 85% of you got that right. I'm terrible <coughs> with Zodiac signs. I'm very impressed that 85% uh, of you got that right. So overall, well done. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you for playing trivia with us. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for sticking around with us. And now I'm excited to bring our next guest to my screen and yours, Gachi Juni Fox, uh, who is a filmmaker, artist, educator. Gachi Juni, thank you for being with me. Thanks, Edgar. Thanks for having me. Uh, so um, you have a, a, a new film out right now. So maybe we could start talking about that uh, a little bit uh, out of the gate. Um, you know, I was watching a trailer uh, for your most recent film, and I'm going to get this kind of wrong, but there's this moment in the trailer where uh, there's a conversation happening and somebody says something along the lines of, you know, history not being necessarily what happened, but being who gets to tell the story. Uh, and it sort of struck me and I sort of thought to myself, I wonder if this is like a driving principle for like why you made this film or why you make films in general. And I suspect maybe it is. It totally is. I want to start by introducing myself. Um, so Sego Gajit Juni Yungets Wakskalewage Akwazasne Nuet Gidolo. So my name is Gajit Juni, which in our language means that I make flowers. Um, I'm from Akwazasne and Mohawk territories, uh, part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, which we our original homeland is here in New York State. So I'm calling from our homeland. Um, and I'm Bear Clan and I'm the director of Without a Whisper. And you're totally right, Edgar. So that's one of the reasons why I make films. Um, I'm an educator in our community. I've been teaching for over 20 years. I'm also an artist. And I see firsthand, you know, how we are um, written out of history in most, most times. 
So in a lot of things, uh, contributions of our people are not recognized and it's important that they are. So that's one of the reasons why I do film. Does that, you know, you say you, you know, you've been an educator for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, is it frustrating? Like, the, is it, like how, like how do you, like how do you not like lose your mind with anger with the idea that, you know, Again, as you say, like contributions from your people, from you know people all over you know this land are are not included in our history. Like, how do you how do you not lose your mind with with just like ah, you know? Well, I'm fortunate. Like, I'm teaching in a public school. Um, the majority of our students in our school are Native American, and the classes that I teach, I have the opportunity to teach them that. So I teach Native studies. So we you know do it in depth teaching, especially on the Haudenosaunee people where we, you know, which we are part of. And I also teach film. So I'm teaching young people how to make films and, you know, have their voices heard. And I also teach traditional art. So I have the opportunity and I have my foot in the door to be able to do that. So that's, you know, I try to look at it from that perspective and try to incorporate and give them as much as I can while I'm in the school. Yeah. I, let's break down some of that that you're talking about just in that answer there. Like, so one, you know, you teach history. So what are what are some of the what are some of the things that like you introduce into your curriculum that that you think are like majorly important that you're like, OK, like if you take nothing else away from this class, you need to know this. I, the, t the class that I teach is like a Haudenosaunee 101. It's very specific to our people. So I teach about our creation story, which has a lot of our teachings in it. And our creation story started, of course, with Sky Woman. So it was a woman that was here first. And that kind of shapes our worldview and how we look at the world as being matrilineal, matrifocal. Um, I talk about the clans and the introduction of clans and why that's important to us, especially in, in areas like when somebody passes away, you know, one clan's family is very sad. So the other, the other clans, you know, help to carry them through that hard time. Um, we I talk about our ceremonies and we're very fortunate that for our people, we still have our ceremonies because there are a lot of native nations that, that was lost. And, and our language is also very key. So those are some of the key things I, I teach and also contributions. So there, there are so many contributions of native people um, to the land. Uh, one of the most important ones is democracy. So for us, the Haudenosaunee people, um, people like Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, looked towards our people and how we governed ourselves and took that and used it for the United States, except they left out something very important, which is the women, because they couldn't even fathom having women, you know, in office. So that, that's a huge contribution. And that not only went to the United States, but all over the world. So democracy was not something that was known too much in other parts of the world. Mm. And also, you know, this film, Women's Rights. Yeah, I was gonna say your, your, your uh, most recent film, Without a Whisper, uh, you, know, it, you, you know, you said the importance of women uh, and also the kind of, you know, sort of lesser known or lesser than should be known contributions of, uh, you know, indigenous people. Uh, those are both addressed in, in, in your most recent film. Talk a little bit about what it's about. So my film, Without a Whisper, is about how our women have been a Shoni influenced the women. Um, the women's rights movement took place, like it started in Seneca Falls. And as I said earlier, I'm, I'm calling you from Haudenosaunee territory, which is pretty much all of New York State. So those early suffragettes were surrounded by our people. And we are very different than them, especially when it came to women. Um, the European American women that were here just even a hundred years ago had no rights. They had no rights in politics, um, no rights in their economy. When they got married, they're a property of their husband. Um, so it was like night and day um, European women compared to you know Native women or Haudenosaunee women. Um, uh, I'm, I I just want to remind folks that if you have questions for Gatji Chuni, uh, please pop them in the Q and A. Uh, I've got one right now from Bob, who's asking about Native American filmmakers in the U.S. Uh, Bob asks, um, you know, are there a lot of them? Um, you know, would you ever collaborate with them? Do you collaborate with each other on different series, etc.? Uh, and he also says, or with Ken Burns, you know, a uh, 
a public broadcasting audience there for sure. Yes, there are other indigenous filmmakers and there's there's not so many of them. So, you know, you get to know each other because it's kind of a small pool. Um, I do work with other um, filmmakers and like bouncing ideas off each other. I mean, I had a creative producer, uh, Tracy Rector, who's from Washington, D.C. She's made over 400 films or not Washington, D.C., Washington State, and she's made over 400 films. Um, I actually just produced a series that um, is going to be coming out soon for Rematriation Magazine, which is a Native women's magazine. And we did 10 segments on different um, Native women from all over. So that's, you know, something new that I'm doing. That's cool. Just because, you, you know, you know, being an educator and a filmmaker and an artist, you've got all this time on your hands. So why not also, you know, work on this thing for a magazine? I mean, yeah, why not, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's yeah, so yeah. important. There's there's so few stories about out there about Indigenous women that are stories of empowerment. You know, most of the time when you see Indigenous women, they're sexualized or they're brutalized. So that isn't what I see in our community. I see a lot of strong women that are doing very empowering things. And, you know, it's important for me as a filmmaker to show that. Yeah, that's great. Um, Pamela is asking about similarities uh, between Wampanoag and Mohawk languages, uh, are there there? And, and I'll broaden that to say sort of languages and cultures. You know, you talk about your people kind of in what we think of as upstate New York today. We're kind of, you know, as the crow flies, not that far from there here in Eastern Massachusetts. So how were those cultures connected, similar language, yes or no, you know, in the, in the years prior to Europeans coming over here? Um, our languages aren't the same, and I wanted to, you know, kind of touch on that because there's over 500 different nations uh, that live on Turtle Island or North America, as you call it, and we all have different languages. We have different ceremonies. Uh, we practice different cultures, and as far as our relationship with the Wampanoag, I want to say sago and greetings to them because I know you're calling from there um, on your end. Uh, we did we did have relations with them because that's where we got our wampum from. So our people um, used wampum as a form of recording our, our treaties and recording important things that happened in our history. And that's where we got our, our wampum from. You know, you, you, you've talked about how your people have retained their ceremonies, other nations had not, um, you know, you talk about how, you know, all these different nations, these different peoples had different ceremonies. What, walk me through like what it, like what a ceremony is, what it might look like, what, why might a, a ceremony be held? Like, and, and why is that important to your people's culture? Well, for us, we still maintain our traditional ceremonies and what our ceremonies are for are to give thanks to everything that is going on around us. So it's a lot different. Like when I, I teach a unit on this in class and we talk about you know the holidays that we have in school versus ceremonies that we mm -hmm. have in the community. And one of the big differences, the holidays that we have in school are mostly celebrating things that happened in the past or people from the past. And for us, our ceremonies are, are celebrating things that are happening like right now. So when the wild strawberries come out, we have a ceremony to give thanks for them. When we hear the thunder beings coming back from the West, we, we have a ceremony to thank them. We have a ceremony for our corn, our beans, our harvest. Um, so there, you know, ours revolves around, you know, what sustains us. And we're very fortunate that we still have that and have the speakers and the knowledge holders to still conduct those ceremonies. And what happens at a ceremony? Like, for example, I mean, you know, pick one as an example and you say you have speakers, et cetera. So like, what, what happens? Well, usually uh, the ceremony will start with our um, Ahanda Galiwadekwa, which is our Thanksgiving address. And it's, um, it's an acknowledgement to all of the natural world. So when we give that acknowledgement, we thank the people, the earth, the waters, the fish, the bugs, the grasses, the medicines, the animals, the trees, the birds. So it starts on the earth and goes up into the sky to the thunder beings, the winds, the sun, the moon, the stars. And we open with that. And then we have like certain dances that go with that and um, speeches that go with that. And it's all done in our language, like just to, to give that, that, you know, that good medicine 
and that thankfulness that we still have those things in our life. What, how, how, how sort of, you know, how large is your community there in upstate New York, both sort of land wise and also people wise? In our community, we have maybe about 12,000 people that live here in Akwesasne territories and really unique community. We have um, an imposed border that runs through our community. So half of our, you know, some of our people live in Ontario and Quebec and some in, live in New York state, but it's, you know, Akwesasne was here before the border. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what are the, what are the sort of, what are the big issues facing, you know, your communities right now? You know, Jean-Luc addressed some of the stuff that, you know, his organization is working on here, um, you know, in an urban environment in Boston and, and in greater Massachusetts. Um, what about for you? In our community, some of the most important things that, that we are working towards is um, making sure that we have, that we're passing on the language and the culture. And we're fortunate in our community that we have a lot of older speakers, um, but we're really working on um, getting our youth to be able to speak. And we have a really great school in the community, the Akwesasne Freedom School, that is a school that's taught entirely in the language. And entirely, the curriculum is based entirely around our culture and trad traditions, and it goes up to grade eight. So we're very fortunate to have that. And we actually get speakers that come out of that school. Mm. So that's one of the most important things. The other thing that I wanted to mention that hasn't been mentioned tonight is um, bringing awareness to missing and murdered women. So this is a phenomenon that's happening in both Canada and the United States where indigenous women go missing and it's not you know, put in the press. It's like very hush hush when it happens to indigenous women and it's something that needs to be addressed. I mean, I, in my film, I talk about how for Haudenosaunee women, um, abuse of women was pretty much unknown to our people. And today it's rampant. Like it's, it's for indigenous people, it's, that's something that's happening to our women and we need to talk about those issues. So what, what, can, what can those of us, you know, who, who hear you talking about this and are, and are sort of like, okay, whoa, this is an issue. What can or should we do, or how do we help? How do we talk about it? Like, what what can be done? I think, like, to learn about it. I mean, there's a lot of different organizations and artists and people that are bringing awareness. I think of like Christine uh, Belcourt did this um, installation of moccasins that was uh, on this topic of missing and murdered women, where she she made all these moccasin vamps that represented all of these women that have passed away, and a lot of them they're um, they're not found or, or their murders are unsolved. Yeah. Thank you for uh, bringing it up. Uh, turning to the Q&A, you know, there's a few questions in the Q&A, um, you know, addressing the issue of trying to be appreciative or integrate or acknowledge without sort of appropriating, yeah. um, you know, and, you know, one, one example here um, from Phoebe who says, that uh, her church is considering, a, they're considering integrating a native land acknowledgement in their services, but you know, they, they don't want to appropriate a tradition or, but like, you know, how do we do that right? Do you have advice for those of us who want to either show support or what have you without sort of appropriating? I think like earlier, um, Jean-Luc did a land acknowledgement when he was on and I also did it too. I, I think land acknowledgement, you're just, acknowledging the land that you're on. And I think a lot of people don't think about that. Like anywhere that you're standing on Turtle Island was somebody's traditional homeland. And just even to acknowledge that is a, is a start in the right direction. Mm. Why Turtle Island? Where, where did we get the name Turtle Island? Turtle Island for us, for the Haudenosaunee people, it's from our creation story. So in our creation story, when Sky Woman came here from the sky, um, it was all water here. And a turtle came up from the water and she landed on the turtle's back and she started to sing songs and the, the turtle expanded into the earth. So that's where the terminology um, Turtle Island comes from. And if you look at the shape of North America, like if you look at it from a distance, it looks like a turtle. 
That's pretty good. I like that. Turtle yeah. Island. How do you say it in, how would you say it in your language? Well, the earth we call it, we say Yekini Sa which means Mother Earth. And that's where we get all of our sustenance from. Are there places that people can go to learn these languages, to learn more about these languages, to learn to speak them even? <laughs> there's apps out there. <laughs> So I know that, like for us, there's there's Mohawk apps that you can you can find. Um, there's things online that you can find. Uh, the, of course, the best place is to actually go to the speakers, and most of them are elderly. What? To, tell me about some of your other films. Uh, not your most recent one, but what what other films have you made, and and what do they center on? So my last film that came out in 2016 was called Under the Husk, and you can find that if you look online. So under the husk film.com. And it was a, a 26 minute documentary um, character based that followed my daughter and her best friend through their rites of passage ceremony. So this is something that we were able to bring back to our community that had been missing for generations. So we were able to bring the ceremony back to transition our young people from adolescence to adulthood. And that, you know, the responsibilities that go with that. What is that ceremony like? Well, the, the way that this, it's for men, are young women and young men. So young women, when they go through their, their moon time, when they start, their, start to menstruate, and for the boys, when their voices change, that's when it's time for them to, to do this. And it's, it's something that they wanna, they wanna do. So it's not something every youth in the community does. It's up to the youth if they wanna go through it. So for the girls, they choose, they choose aunties that'll be their mentors and it can't be their mom. Because at that time when they're adolescents, you know, you're kind of button heads with your parents because you want to be independent. <laughs> so, so you pick aunties and it doesn't even have to be like blood relatives. It could be people that they really look up to. And it's a four year uh, process or a four year ceremony that they go oh, wow. through. And they learn like they'll meet like weekly and they'll get different teachings like on how to cook, on how to build a fire, on the creation story, like all of our, you know, cultural teachings. And then in the spring, they do a fast. So they, they go by themselves and they'll build like they have a little lodge and they'll stay out there um, by themselves with no food and water. And every, every year they stay out there longer. So the first year it's one day and then next year, two days, three days. And then the last, it's four days for the final when they finish. And when they come out, then they, they're with the women or they're with the men. Wow, how long, how long has that been, how long has that been reintroduced, that, that ceremony? Um, it's, this is going to be the 17th year, and it's not only going on in our community, it's expanded to other Haudenosaunee communities, like it's also in Tainanega, Six Nations, Oneida, so a lot of um, the other communities have come to learn from us and then have started it in their own communities. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah. How is it? Is it popular? Do, like, are are like? Is it like something that like only a couple kids do, or is it like something that's kind of cool to do? I don't know if I would term it as that. It's because it's such a humbling thing to do that. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I've seen, and that's why I made a film about it because I noticed the big difference in the youth that went through that. Because if you put somebody out in the woods like that and they're isolated. And just think about how, how you'd feel if it was you. Yeah. You have, you have no food, you have no water, you have no phone, um, and you're just sitting there with all of your relatives in nature. And so it really humbles you to do that. And it's is that, a very is it, uh, trying experience to do that. But I find that the youth that come through that find themselves quicker. So they, they're out there to find what are their gifts? Like, why are, why are they here? Like, why were they sent here? And that's, you know, that's kind of what we're all trying to do while we're here. So that's one thing that helps them in that direction. Do you, do you find, or have you found, or, you know, maybe even through your film, this is sort of part of it, but for it, does it, does it become as important for the, the woman who's chosen as the auntie, like the, the sort of mentor figure is, does it end up being as, as like sort of meaningful to them as it is to the teen who's going through it? I, I absolutely think so. I mean, I had a hard time making that film because it was so touching for everybody that was involved with it, the moms, the dads, the aunties, but I just had to focus on the point of view of the youth because that, that was my focus for the film. A lot of the aunties that are mentoring have never gone, they've not, never done it themselves. 
So it's like they're being able to kind of experience that through the youth. And we've been doing it so long that now that some of those youth that have gone through it are now coming back as the mentors. Oh, wow. So my, my daughter and my son both have gone back to, to be aunties and uncles to other people, other youth that are coming through. Oh, wow. So, you're, so you're, your son and your daughter both went through it. And yeah. wow. My son was in the very first group and there was only seven of them. And then now there's, there could be up to 100 people that are fasting. So it's really grown. That is, that is wild. That is really interesting. Yeah. Um, we have a couple questions in the Q and A. Um, you know, obviously we're coming up on Thanksgiving right now. Um, you know, and you know, Jean Luc talked a little bit about the, you know, the National Day of Mourning. Um, but Teresa is asking, like, in the eyes of Native of Americans, you know, is there a proper way for people of European descent to celebrate Thanksgiving? Is it a is it a tricky time of year for folks, you know, from the various native nations here? Um, what are your thoughts as Thanksgiving rolls around? I think that to, to stop perpetuating the old, um, you know, pilgrims and Indians myths that are out there. Um, for me, what I would say, you know, as a Haudenosaunee woman is to, to be grateful for everything that we have in nature. Like I said earlier, that's one of our main teachings is the, the Thanksgiving address. So there's there's books on that. Uh, Jake Swamp has written a book on the Thanksgiving address. There's other books on that. There's even videos on it that you can find online. I just showed one in class today. So those are some ways that you can you can be honoring the natural world on Thanksgiving. Mm. Uh, I'm speaking with Gajit Juni Fox. Uh, our time is almost up. Uh, I'm going to really quickly welcome my colleague Sarah back. And then I've got one more question for Gajit Juni. Uh, and then we're going to have to be on our way. But before that, here's Sarah. Thanks, Edgar. And thanks, everybody, so much for tuning in tonight. Contributions from viewers like you support GBH's ongoing efforts to develop new and better ways to reach and engage audiences, students, and educators promoting a deeper understanding of history. You, yes, you at home can help bring more stories to life. You can visit wgbh.org slash support events to make a $60 donation all at once or in monthly installments. And you can receive this GBH Midnight Blue Tumblr as our thank you. Just click the, ch the chat link to be brought to our site. And thank you so much for spending time with us and thanks moreover for your support. Back to you, Edgar. Thank you. Uh, thank you to you for being with us. Uh, thank you, Gaji Juni. Um, before I let you go, you know, I love to, I, I, I love talking with, uh, you know, with other media makers, filmmakers, writers, um, you know, specifically not about, not just about their work, but about work that they like. So I'm going to ask you for, uh, you know, you as a filmmaker and artist for a recommendation for us, other than your own work, which we should all go check out, but what's a film or a book that like, you know, you would like highly recommend to the, to those of us here, um, you know, either related to what we've been talking about or one that you just love that you feel like doesn't get enough attention. There's um, one of my favorite films is from Taika Waititi. It's called Boy, and I think it's on Amazon. So that's just one of my personal favorites. I, I really love reading Joy Harjo. So she she's a poet laureate right now. Um, she also has a new memoir that's out that's great. So those are a few of my personal recommendations of books I like to read. Love it. I love that stuff. Gaji Juni, uh, you should know before uh, we get out of here, her latest film, Without a Whisper, is currently airing on GBH. It will be on GBH World uh, the 24th mm -hmm. uh, at 9.30 p.m., but it is also this month streaming on pbs.org. So uh, you've got a couple days left, a couple weeks left in this month, so you can check that out, right? And we should all check it out, right? Right? <laughs> Absolutely. Gajit Juni, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Uh, I really appreciate you being with us today. Thanks for having me. It was great and thank you for having me on your screen uh, live from my living room here in Somerville. Uh, that's it for Boston Talks. Uh, we will be back with another one so keep your eyes on your email and at uh, wgbh.org uh, for details about our next Boston Talks. That's about it. Uh, I'm Edgar Biharwick III from GBH's Curiosity Desk. Stay curious out there and thank you for being with us tonight.